everyone. Welcome to the Vertech Knowledge Series. Um, we're happy to have you joining us again. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, we are, this meeting is being recorded as we post all these on our YouTube channel a few days after we host them. And so this one will be on by early next week. And I feel like I always say I'm excited about each one, but I am truly excited because we have a very exciting presenter, um, Dr. Susan Sigurd. I'm gonna jump right into it because we have no time to waste. We've got a lot of great content. So Susan Sigurd, hi, Susan. Hi, Fernando. Uh, Susan Sigurd is an associate professor in the Division of Biokinesiology and Physical Therapy at the University of Southern California. She's also the director of the division's Human Performance Laboratory and the director of the MS Sports Science Emphasis. Dr. Sigurd's research aims to identify and ameliorate impaired mechanics that relate to lower extremity injury with a focus on knee injury and rehab. Her work has contributed to the understanding of impaired mechanics following ACL injury with a specific emphasis on early rehab, as well as health factors such as experience, age, training, and sex influence the development of movement strategies that increase risk for ACL injuries. Her passion is in the translation of biomechanical assessments from the research laboratory to the clinic by identifying mechanisms to simplify the process of using technology to identify and resolve impairments. So very fitting that we have Dr. Sigurd here to present to us today, and um, we're excited to explore that topic. And then, of course, we have Fernando Santos. Dr. Santos has his PhD in biomechanics and movement sciences and is an accomplished PT who worked with Paralympic athletes and people with balance impairments in his own clinic. He's a senior applied biomechanist with Vertec and also, of course, my partner in creating this webinar series. Uh, so welcome back, everyone. And before I go ahead and share my screen and start Dr. Sigward's presentation, just a reminder that um, we, this is uh, about 48 minutes long, so we'll only have about five minutes of live Q&A at the end of the hour. So please, please don't hesitate to put your questions in the chat function in Zoom um, throughout the, the pre-recording when we play that. And then uh, Dr. Sigward and Dr. Santos will answer those questions as they come up, and then they'll continue to answer those in the Q&A at the end. Okay, and on that note, I am going to share my screen and start the presentation. So bear with me for just a second. And here we go. Uh, thanks, Alyssa and Fernando, for inviting me. Um, I'm excited to talk about uh, some of the application of my research today. Um, I wanna give you a little bit more background on who I am. Um, I practiced for about 10 years as a physical therapist and athletic trainer before going back to school to get my PhD. Um, well, most of my research has been um, motivated by my clinical experiences. More recently, it's been fairly heavily motivated by figuring out how to translate um, what we're doing or finding in the research lab to practice. And this has made it a little bit easy, easier with this rapid expansion of data and technology across all aspects of our life. And I'm particularly interested in trying to identify effective and efficient uses of technology and, uh, for, for use in clinical decision making. And I know there are a lot of barriers to using technology in the clinic from expense and time constraints to really the challenge of interpreting these new sources of information in the context of what we do. And I'm gonna touch on that a little bit as we go through here and, and put sort of the force plate assessment variables in the context of what we understand from the clinical perspective. Uh, much of our recent work has actually looked at the value of force plates um, from the biomechanical perspective of the 3D uh, motion analysis. It, uh, force plates are only really a component of what we do, but um, if we were to break those components down and pick one or another, we're starting to find that we get quite a bit of information from, um, from these force plates. And what we've been trying to do is figure out how good is this information and how can this be applied in the clinic. So I'm a pretty big fan of this modality and I was, I was happy that um, Bertek asked me to come in and talk about it. Um, so in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to walk you through what I see as some of the current and future benefits of force plate technology in the clinic. And, um, and I want to uh, recognize that you guys recognize I don't have a financial relationship or product disclosure with Bertech or any other um, or, or any other technology. So let's start with our traditional framework for clinical movement assessment as our model. And I want you guys to think about this and what you do in the clinic. Uh, your patient performs a task, right? Um, you observe the movement and you assess it with respect to a set of expectations. And then you interpret good or bad, acceptable or unacceptable based on a set of criteria that you've established. 
Now, keep in mind when you're doing when you're doing movement assessments, and then when we go to add technology on, we keep the same framework, but we need to fill these blanks in a little bit um, differently. So, first of all, um, using force plates or technology doesn't really allow us to to uh, assess fancier movements. It allows us to be better at assessing the movements that we're currently assessing. So a couple of things that you need is you need a relevant task and then you need task specific expectations and criteria. So think about this and what you're doing now. If you have an ACL, uh, uh, someone with the ACL injury and think about your exercises and your movement strategies and what tasks do you use um, to assess how they're doing. Now, I think, I think about maybe a step down, a squat, a jump, a, a single limb hop. These are fairly patterned movements. Think about them assessing these and then what are you looking for as far as acceptable or unacceptable? Now, this is, this is our wheelhouse. We analyze, we observe movement. Um, we're movement uh, specialists here. So I want you to really think about this context. And again, try to think of this in the context of, of tasks that are a little bit more patterned that have movement expectations. So let's now um, put uh, our ACL um, population in here. And um, let's throw a little bit of research in and, and, and say, if we use this framework here, we know that there are very well documented movement deficits that we target in rehabilitation uh, after ACL reconstruction. So we'll, we're gonna review some of these too. Consistent across tasks and throughout recovery, these individuals struggle to regain knee function. And this knee function that they're struggling to regain is specifically in the sagittal plane. Now, these impairments, um, movement impairments, are described um, through the following sort of biomechanical variables. So decrease in limb loading, decrease in knee flexion excursion, um, extensor moment, power, and then sort of associated compensations. You could think of associated compensations in the sagittal plane, maybe uh, ankle load or hip load or ankle moments or, I'm sorry, ankle angles or hip angles. And we can also consider some of the out of plane movements. I call this out of plane movement uh, because it's out of the sagittal plane, which is our primary plane of movement. But these other out of plane movements, we focus on a lot as well. So we think of frontal and transverse plane motions, patterns of motion at the knee, the hip, the pelvis, or the trunk. You may be starting to think of these as maybe an isolated impairment, or we, we assess a movement saying that um, this uh, out of plane movement is saying, for example, perhaps the hip is not strong enough. But I also want to challenge you to think that perhaps an out of plane movement is compensating for a lack of a movement or a lack of capacity in the surgical knee in the sagittal plane. So you could interpret these in, in a couple different ways, but those are the expected deficits we would see. And then we can put our, um, we can put our tasks, our relevant tasks that will challenge these. Now, if you look at this list to the left, you can see that several of these uh, are related to force. So limb, limb loading, a knee extensor moment, power, um, and some of those associated compensations. So this is really what I want to be focusing on here are the loading deficits or the, the deficits that we can get a little more information about when we have force data. These are particularly important because one, they are profound, long lasting and attributed to poor outcomes. These are pretty big deficits. And in many cases, the deficits are much greater than they look. And that really is the problem from clinical decision making is that right now we're experts at observing movement, but um, as we've seen in our research and many people have seen in their research is that you can look pretty good, but you could still have a pretty big loading deficit. And I'm going to take you through a little bit of this. I'm going to refer to two different types of loading deficits. It'll be important for you to sort of understand those when we're talking about uh, force plate or force technology. We have limb loading, which um, is really the force that's accommodated through the whole entire limb in a task. And, and this is sort of the weight bearing load. Um, and what we're seeing in these deficits is a decrease in a vertical ground reaction force is a good example here. And that vertical force you can see in the picture to the right, there's two arrows there. And the height of those arrows is, is um, um, scaled to the amount of force under each limb. So here we can see there's more force under the left limb than under the right limb. 
Now, the other loading deficit, which is uh, going to be a little trickier for us um, in identifying these sort of problems uh, clinically, is the sagittal plane knee loading. Now, uh, we, we refer to knee loading as a, a knee extensor moment, and this is um, how much the knee extensors are accommodating the par parts of this vertical or limb force. Now, we're going to, a, a moment is, is also a torque. Um, moment and torque can be used interchangeably. Um, and, and this is something that we can calculate. We can break this limb loading down and we can calculate it as the individual contributions across the joints when we're using a full 3D biomechanics package. However, this is gonna be something important that we wanna be able to detect in the clinic. Now I'm gonna give you a little bit of background here um, to convince you that these are the deficits that you need to be thinking about clinically. Um, these loading deficits um, persist long-term. And there's two recent systematic review studies um, that looked at lower extremity mechanics during double um, and single limb landing, and they found large effect sizes for both decrease in a vertical ground reaction force and decrease in knee extensor moments in the surgical limb um, during these uh, a variety of single and double limb tasks. Now you can see um, the effect size is saying uh, is, is giving us an idea of the consistency of these in the magnitude of these differences across tasks. And if we just quickly look at this um, the comparison of effect sizes, you can see there's the list of the studies, and I believe this one was taken from the Hughes study. There were seven high-quality studies that um, they actually saw in the extensor moments in, and of course they've used, they looked at a couple different variables. I, you can refer to the, um, the papers if you're interested, but you can see that all these studies have negative effect sizes, so those dots are on the negative side there, and that means that the surgical limb is, uh, the extensor moments are lower than the um, non-surgical limb, and really only one of them is, uh, has a confidence interval that uh, we'll say crosses zero, very close to zero, which means that when we combine all of this evidence together, there's a pretty strong pattern of having substantial deficits in the extensor moments. Now, these guys were, uh, these studies that they looked at were people who have returned to sports um, or returned to high level activities or beyond. So at this time point, we are still seeing some fairly substantial knee, um, knee loading deficits. I want to highlight um, the, da the data from one study. You can see in here, it's the Renner et al. study. There are a couple dashes here and the, with the biggest effect sizes. But I want to highlight what they saw in this study because this really highlights a case of perhaps where our expectations as clinicians don't quite match up with reality. Um, and I plotted this data, so apo I apologize for the crude sort of um, graph here, but this is knee extensor moments. And what they did is they had uh, 23 athletes perform a stop jump task, which is uh, approach, land on both on two feet. So you're, you're kind of horizontally approaching, to land on two feet and then jump up. And they did this in the same group of individuals at four, five, six, and then 12 months after surgery. And not surprising, if we were to graph the knee extensor moment for the surgical limb and compare it to the non-surgical limb, at four months, this is a task where there's a fairly significant deficit here in the knee extensor moments. And that's probably not surprising. It's probably the time at which they're starting to perform this task. We would expect, however, that there would be improvement in resolution of this deficit over time. But as I plot these numbers here, you can see that there may be sort of a, uh, a decrease in the between limb deficits here, but it really remains, and it remains uh, at six months, again, probably at a time when they're returning to their sports, and then, and, and then 12 months later. So um, this is, you know, this is a concern here, and, and, um, and, and I, I'm going to argue that part of the reason why some of these deficits don't resolve over time is because we don't know that they're there, not because we're not doing good enough uh, rehab. Um, I want to highlight one more thing with respect to all these studies is, is that um, if we look at these same studies, these are similar studies. They, these were the ones that were looking at knee flexion angle, and we look at deficits in knee flexion angle across studies. We can see that um, these decreases um, in the surgical limb or negative effect sizes here are really very inconsistent across studies. The effect sizes are, are small, and I believe there are only five out of 18 of these effect sizes that don't cross zero. 
So those that are crossing zero are gonna are not going to support the fact that this is a very consistent finding. So this goes back to the fact that we may not be able to see what's going on. And I'm just using the flexion angle as an example here. There were other, uh, again, other angle measurements that they looked at in these studies. So let's consider these deficits in sort of our criterion-based rehab. And if you progress your patient to more demanding tasks when they look good in a less demanding task, then you're following a criterion-based progression. And I would, I would, this progression here was adapted from a consensus statement um, in 2016. So my guess is that people are generally following this sort of progression, and that, that, that something harder happens after they do something well that is that is easier. So as far as loading is concerned, we want to be able to do this. You think about strength training. You progressively load, and that is going to induce muscle adaptation, improve strength. In this case, improve the mechanics and improve the function, and then allow them to do higher demanding tasks. Um, the studies we just talked about are included in those reviews, identify deficits sort of at this later time point here as they're returning to sport or returning to play, and, and, and then the one study across those time periods. Um, however, what I want to do here is take a few minutes to illustrate what these loading deficits look like in early rehab and how our expectations are very clearly not matching our reality. Um, the deficits we just talked about, you could say perhaps these people weren't ready to do these high level tasks at this time. Um, but I'm going to kind of give you uh, uh, an idea of um, perhaps uh, one of the underlying uh, issues with not seeing these deficits early on. Now, uh, unweighted double limb squat during early re rehabilitation is, you know, it's probably started really early. And by the end of early re rehabilitation, by the time you're returning to your sport specific drills, you're expecting that they can do a squat, a body weight squat and do that pretty well. Certainly by three to five months, loading during squatting is not a primary focus in exercises. Um, I love looking at squatting because it's a it's a common task. It's not so complex. Uh, it presents, you know, represents, you know, perhaps an early exercise that um, that that the uh, patients are doing. Um, but uh, and it has recognized performance expectations. Both legs are going down and coming up. Um, there's not a shift to either side. So I like this task um, sort of as a measure of, of what patterns these guys are adopting. So let me walk you through some data. Um, and this is one of the studies that we've published, but we've looked at a lot of data since this with a very similar um, very similar results. So this is really very consistent. We had individuals um, squat, um, go down as far as you can, come back up, um, no, you know, do this without pain, um, and repeat this this task uh, three times for three different trials. And then we measured their knee extensor moments and then the ground reaction forces, which is their limb loading. And these guys did this at three months post-op and at five months post-op. And these were sort of typically progressing people. They didn't have any other extra injuries. They weren't in non-weight bearing situations um, uh, in early rehab. And what we found here, as you can see um, here on the um, x-axis, is the time for three and then five months. Um, for knee extensor moment, sorry, the graph's off here a little bit, the surgical limb is in red and the non-surgical in black. And you can see that the knee extensor moment is lower um, in the surgical versus the non-surgical limb um, at three and five months. Now, this deficit is about 38% at three months, and these same people two months later continue to have a 30% deficit in how much they're loading their knee extensors in a submaximal task. Now, when we look at the stats here, um, this was not a significant difference or improvement over time. So um, we can see this, this is probably improving a little bit, but certainly not to what I would expect clinically. Now, when we look at the ground reaction forces, we see a difference at both time periods. Um, the magnitude of this difference is, uh, is quite a bit smaller. And this, to me, it means that the limb loading in the surgical limb at both time points is less than the limb loading in the non-surgical limb. So they're just not putting as much weight on their leg. They're shifting it over to the opposite leg. Now, what makes these issues really hard um, to identify clinically, I'm going back to this, this absence of really appreciable differences in joint angles. 
um, when we looked at the differences in hip angle, ankle angle, and knee angle, we saw a three degree difference between limbs and knee flexion angle and no difference in hip angle or uh, hip or ankle angle, which really, again, even if we're looking at these, visually looking at these, or even recording this with some sort of video recording, three degree difference is really hard to identify. And a three degree difference is attributed to almost a 40% decrease in how much they're using their knee extensors. So this to me um, and our group was, you know, what what's going on? This the, There's something here that that's not quite right. Now, what we did is um, we looked a, a little bit further into this information because one thing um, that, that we can sort of under or uh, see a sort of a mismatch here is this 38 versus the 15 or the 13 percent. So how are they really underloading their knee so much when they're only shifting a little bit of their body weight over to the other leg? So what we did find in this is that we, we calculated how much of this limb load was being accommodated at the knee versus the hip, and we created a ratio out of that. So this hip to knee extensor moment ratio. And in the non-surgical limb, them, you can see that at both time points, um, that ratio is at about one. And that means that there was sort of an equal distribution in the hip extensor moment and the knee extensor moment. However, you can see in the surgical limb that the uh, ratio was higher than that, which means there was preferential loading of the hip extensors versus the knee extensors. And again, this is without appreciable differences in, in angles. Um, what we found later in, in sort of combing through this data is we found that the way that the uh, individuals were accomplishing this decrease in knee extensor moment at month three was they were decreasing their uh, ground reaction force and shifting to the hip. So a combination of strategies, um, each individual was using a combination of strategies. Now, five months, these same individuals with still a profound knee extensor moment deficit, when we looked at that data, it appeared that this knee problem, this knee deficit was really accomplished by shifting to the hip. Now, that makes it really tricky because we're about to talk about force plates, right? So we talk about force plates, they're giving us an idea of force, and that is not always the uh, primary or even singular factor in them not using or, or detecting these knee extensor moment deficits. So I'm gonna make an argument that um, in large part, many of our loading deficits may be invisible. Now, what I wanna say here is that we can't always depend on observable changes in joint angles. Now, of course, we know that when we observe um, differences in joint angles or alterations in movement, we see that a lot. And that's really what we act on in our, in our, uh, you know, our clinical plan. Um, however, and if those are there, we could probably assume that there are some fairly substantial loading deficits, but we can't always assume that that we're going to be able to pick up a loading deficit by watching these, this movement. So, you know, this, this is, this becomes a little bit tricky in our decision, clinical decision making and I'm, I might argue um, that that may be one of the reasons that these loading deficits persist, not because we're not, um, they're not able to progress and, and, and use the knee that way, but, but they're, they're doing something very subtle to not have to do that. And we have a sort of a line of work looking at that too. Are they able to do it or are they just, they just have developed this bad pattern? Now I wanna show you how subtle um, or how invisible um, this is, uh, this shift is. Now, if we bring this, um, this little picture back up here, um, we are looking at um, the ground reaction forces uh, and where they, where the center of pressure is. So the application of those forces at the foot. Now, the demand across the joints isn't just going to be dictated by these ground reaction forces. And this little picture to the right, the ground reaction forces are about the same height. That that it's about the same height there, but. Um, it's also uh, um, dictated by it, the application of these forces to the body and then to the joints. Now, um, what we're looking at here is uh, from the side is we're going to be looking at the center of pressure um, in sort of the four aft components. So our center of pressure would be where that little uh, arrow starts on our force plate there. And then that ground reaction force vector, if we're just looking at a vertical force is going straight up 
Um, and now we can sort of theoretically look at how this force uh, is relative to, um, to the joints. Now, when we calculate individual joint demands, we use inverse dynamics. Like I said before, we use a lot of different information for this. So this is really a theoretical or uh, more of an estimate of, of what's going on at the joint. Um, but Matt, uh, Matt Chan, um, one of my former PhD students, um, begged me to look at this data. I told him, go do your dissertation, but no, he wanted to look at this data and it turned out to be pretty cool data. Um, so uh, what we do here is if we look at uh, this is the theoretical, uh, the sort of the theoretical construct here. If we look at this force um, and its trajectory and its relationship to the joint, we can see that the force uh, trajectory is anterior to the hip joint. It is posterior to the knee joint. Whoa, sorry. And it is anterior um, to the ankle joint. In this case, it, the force wants to flex the hip, flex the knee, and dorsiflex the ankle. And that force is being applied to those joints at a distance, which is the moment arm. And the moment arm there for the hip and the knee are illustrated in these dashed lines. Now, if we think about a torque, it's force times moment arm. So if the force is the same at both of these joints, but the moment arm is greater, then it is placing a larger demand at the joint. So in this case, and again, this is very theoretical estimate, with the center of pressure being back here on the foot, um, this vertical force has a larger moment arm um, at the knee than at the hip, which is now requiring the knee to do uh, produce more torque than the hip. Now, if we were to theoretically move this uh, center of pressure forward, and I apologize, uh, it looks like it's moved it to the toenails there, which is not accurate. <laughs> um, I think my arrow might be off of my illustration a little bit, but, but bear with me. Let's pretend that the foot's a little longer. Um, now we can see that these moment arms, the relative length of these moment arms is actually changing. So the hip moment arm is larger, and, or the, the moment arm at the hip is larger and at the knee is smaller. So again, theoretically, the force times that moment arm at the knee compared to this previous position is asking the, the knee to do much less. So the, the idea is, is that they could shift their center of pressure here, they could shift the position of their center of pressure, and then that can shift the demands at, at each of the joints. And the theory was, is that if there's a more anterior center of pressure, it shifts the demands to the hip relative to the knee. And in fact, um, when we looked at these data, we found that that was true. So again, this is a hip to knee extensor moment ratio and a one is gonna be uh, equal distribution from the hip and the knee. Now we plotted uh, the surgical and the non-surgical limb um, data for these. So each of these dots is a limb with the non-surgical limb being um, the circles and the surgical limb being the X's. So it shouldn't be a surprise that there are a lot of X's over here based on the data that we talked about, right? So these guys are generally using a strategy that's a little bit more uh, hip dominant. And then you can see as you bring, uh, as you come back over here on the Y axis, they shifted their center of pressure slightly more forward in their foot. So this would be the heel at zero and 100% would be probably what I have here in this picture at the toenails. Um, so in fact, we did find that there was a relationship between how they shifted their center of pressure and how they distributed their forces uh, within that limb. Now, um, when we considered that data there, so here we want to say, how can we use this information just from a force plate? And, and let me back up and tell you that a force plate gives you the force and the center of pressure. So it can tell you where on that plate most of that force is being um, applied. And what we said is now, now can we look at how these guys are performing this task? And does that center of pressure explain how they are uh, compensating? So this right here is the between limb center of pressure ratio right here. And at one, that means the center of pressure is going to be at the same spot between the two limbs. Right. If it's a greater than one, then that center of pressure was positioned more anteriorly in the surgical limb. And if it was less than one, um, the, the center of pressure was going to be placed uh, more posteriorly in the surgical limb. So when we look at all of these individuals, so these are now, um, this is looking at both limbs and these are our individuals. Some of them are clustering down here behind one, 
and then we have a cluster of these up here um, where that the difference between limbs is um, related to a, a bigger shift anteriorly in that surgical limb and in fact um, these people that shifted anteriorly had a larger um, hip to knee extensor ratio. So that means that they were using more hip than knee um, to perform this task. Now, what's interesting is we looked at this difference, we took this difference and we combined it with the difference between limbs and their vertical ground reaction force. And that's what we looked at in our first study. And, and we found that it explained 70% of the variance between these two in the knee deficits in these individuals. So that's a fairly good prediction just using force and the location of that force um, between the limbs. And that gave us a pretty good idea of uh, the extent or even the presence of these deficits. So let's take this background information and now apply it to sort of clinical force plate assessment. So I'm going to apply a couple things here. Some of it's going to be a little bit lighter than what we just did there, but um, I want to come back to this framework here as to where we're saying we perform a task, we observe a movement, we have an expectation, and then we have uh, an interpretation based on that expectation. So with our force platforms, we aren't observing a motion or a movement. That's not the variable we're looking at. All of a sudden, we have a number. We have a number and it's a ground reaction force. So that does not equate to what we typically use as far as an assessment. So we now need to form a new expectation. So anytime you have a new technology, whatever it gives you, you need to be able to put that in the context of what's going on with your patient. And it also needs to be in a context of what you understand or the principles that you understand. So here we're going to look at ground reaction forces. Um, and then I put center of pressure on here because we just talked about that. And I'm going to sort of finish with the center of pressure parts of this. So we have our expectations, um, the deficits. These are the movement deficits that we would expect. We had expect that they're occurring in the sagittal plane. So uh, we would likely be then having them do sagittal plane tasks of a certain demand and, and, and take a look at these, um, these variables. Now, our criteria, our expectations, how do we translate those expectations um, into some sort of performance criteria? So uh, first thing you need to do in any sort of new technology, the easiest way to, 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 find, to define a performance criteria is to say, I'm gonna see how the good leg does it and I'm gonna compare the bad leg to it. So here we, all, we now have some numbers that are gonna come out to us and now we can say, I expect that there could be a deficit between limbs. So that's our first level of performance criteria and, and probably the best thing in any time you're adopting any new technology. Now the second level, and, and if you go to conferences or if you're, if you're considering this at a very high level, the second level is going to be that um, we can't always assume that symmetry um, or symmetrical function um, means that they're back to their previous level or even to the level that we want them to be at. So the next level of criteria is to uh, compare these numbers or what they're doing to their healthy expectations. Um, this is quite a bit more difficult and it requires that we have, again, expectations. Okay, so I'm gonna start walking through some of force plate, uh, this quick history of force plates and how they got to the clinic. Um, and I'm gonna start to lay out what these expectations are and, that, and, the, and the reason why I like where force plates are right now. So if we, if we talk about force plates, really um, the translation of this technology for commercial use uh, has really been driven by the use of a vertical jump task. And um, you do a vertical jump task, you may uh, recognize the vertex, and across um, uh, performance um, uh, settings, um, athletic performance settings, this is, you know, been a gold standard of, um, of lower limb power, strength, coordination. Um, and this is a pretty common metric that people use. And, it, and even now changes in jump height with respect to uh, readiness or fatigue. So over the past five to 10 years, um, they've incorporated actually the use of force plates. And you can see this little, uh, this little schematic down here. And this is where we're gonna start talking about expectations. This is the force that comes out of a force plate over time during a counter movement jump. And we'll use that as our example right now. But 
because they've used this vertical jump height and um, these metrics that come from our force plates as criterion for performance or fatigue, et cetera, we're starting to get a really good idea of what our expectations are. And um, let's walk through those a little bit here. So uh, we have our jumping and landing tasks um, and they are going to give us a vertical ground reaction force profile. And again, that's the magnitude of the ground reaction force over time is gonna give us, um, give us our profile. Um, in many of these commercial designs, um, it's usually only the vertical force that they're looking at. And we'll talk about this uh, as we go along here, but it's a pretty powerful metric. I, I think even, in, even just using that in our, in our athletic po or in our uh, recovering population. So again, this is our common path right here, jumping and landing. They use a lot of metrics from this profile to determine different components of performance. Now let's throw injury on there. Now, Think about this for a minute. Um, what we've set up until now, the easiest thing to think about is for vertical forces is the fact that in injury, they may be shifting the demand off of that uh, surgical limb. And now we can calculate this if they're standing on two force plates. Now, the really great thing about the force plates is we have a variable of force. We have a profile or a shape which is the expected shape when they perform a certain task. And from the force, force equals MA, um, we can derive, uh, not we, they can derive a bunch of different variables that help us out in, in, again, operationalizing how we assess this. So I went from this profile to this profile. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but this darker line here is the same sort of expected profile. And then each of these other lines are things that can be calculated using just this force. So we have force, they can uh, calculate displacement, velocity, um, using uh, force and velocity to calculate power, et cetera. The other nice part of these uh, different components is you can see that they don't all change direction at the same time. So each of these components is actually helping us break down what what the individual is doing across these different phases of the um, of the force profile. So I'm gonna we'll walk you through um, this force profile here, and uh, and I'll do that with um, some uh, patient data here. So this um, this young man I can't remember. I think he is five months post reconstruction, and um, he's performing a vertical jump. Uh, and you can see here is here is a uh, his vertical ground reaction force time curve, and we have the left leg is his surgical leg um, compared to uh, his right leg, so in red and in black. Now, here's our expected profile. And from this overall graph, we can see a couple things. First of all, we can see that the force starts up here in 400, and um, that is where he is standing still. If we summed these together, those Newtons would be equivalent to his, um, his body weight, his body mass. So we can see that there's something going on here, right? And then it drops down to zero. So that means there's he's in the air and then we have a high force on the other side so already we can break down this entire movement into the jump flight and landing phases so let's go a little bit further here and we can look at these graphs and say okay there looks like there's a difference between the right and the left leg so let's break this down a little bit further here now in this um jumpy repeated short <laughs> video here um what we're looking at is uh going from the standing at those lines around 400 newtons to uh, the unweighting phase. So in the counter movement jump, they drop down from the standing position and they're dropping their center of mass, creating the unweighting phase here where the, the uh, force is less than the body weight. And what this does is it leads to this sort of eccentric contraction. So when, or this eccentric phase. So when they drop their body weight, they're eventually gonna have to slow that center of mass down and reverse it to jump back up. And that is what's happening right here. 
Now, um, these phases are usually identified based on a combination of the force, um, the velocity, or the center mass displacement that we looked at before. But what happens in this eccentric phase here is you can see that there is, at least in his left leg, there's a little bit of a bump here. Now, if we looked at this whole ground reaction force curve, I would first say, even if I combined this together, that I don't think the shape of that curve is what I expect. I expect to see two bumps, a bump here and a bump here, and that they'd be at least closer together. So here we are looking at the force that's being generated as he's uh, about to, or slowing the lowering of his body weight and about to reverse that. And this um, this is going to um, sort of coincide with that deepest position or where, where we see there in his, um, in his lowering. Now, the great part again about this curve is we can visually look at it and say, whoa, the, right, the red and the black line look different here and look quite a bit different. We could pick a peak number and we could quantify a percent difference. Um, we could also look at how much area is under this curve here. So how much of that sort of total force or what we call impulse um, is being accommodated in each of these limbs. So not only can we look at a difference between limbs, we can say it's during this eccentric portion of this task. Now, if we move on to our next phase, you can see that we do have this, um, this point from the lowest position. Um, we have that first peak, and I'll see if I can do this with my video, to um, the leaving the ground. So that is where they generate this maximum propulsive force. So this is going to be a concentric contraction versus this being eccentric control here at the bottom. And again, we can compare that there are different magnitudes. He's using his right leg more than his left leg to create this maximum force. We could look at area under the curve. Oops, excuse me. Um, we could look at area under the curve, but again, the shape of expected shape of this curve and the other variables give us a phase to look at. Um, we have a phase. We know what part of the of the task they have a deficit in. We have two limbs that we can compare to each other. Um, we obviously have uh, a um, flight phase, um, and we can use some information to estimate how, how high he jumps, so that goes to a performance variable. And then we have this landing phase, and, and I'm have to say I'm not, I, I don't love assessing the landing phase after a counter movement jump because it could very much depend on how well they jumped in the air, air. but you can see a very similar force profile during a drop land, where you see this really high peak landing force. And if you look really closely here at this graph, you can see that he's accommodating the landing in his right leg more than, than his left here. And then as he goes through and starts to stabilize here, um, more of that again is happening in his um, right leg compared to his left. That, that's an example of a counter movement jump, looking at forces in two limbs, um, giving us an expected curve. Um, telling us that how he's performing the jump overall and how each of the limbs are performing. From there, we can pick numbers off if we want to and, and, and put some objective criteria to that. So in this case, and this is something that's fairly available right now, uh, again, for the sort of the athletic population. In this case, we get a great idea about limb loading performance. Um, we can quantify force, we can quantify power, and we can break this down over time. This is really good um, metric to use in double limb tasks. Obviously, we could use this same uh, type of setup if we wanted to do a squat, right? We could look at the differences and forces between the limb. And if we we're particularly good at it, we could look at the differences in the forces and the differences in the center of pressure. Um, so double limb task, this is pretty, this is, gives us some pretty good information that we didn't have by necessarily observing the task. In single limb tasks, we can compare these two uh, expected curves again, and we can compare the right to the left um, and look at uh, overall performance deficits as well. As well, did they is there the maximum amount of force that they're generating um, similar between the limbs? So. This is, this is my enthusiasm right here for the force plates, and that may be underwhelming for some of you, but very exciting for me. Um, you could use this in your athletic populations and probably across different lower extremity injuries. This is just ACL, for example. 
but what it doesn't do is give us our individual joint contributions. So this, uh, this issue of not being able to identify uh, individual joint contributions is, is an issue if we reflect back on the slides that I showed before. What I wanna do in the, in the last few pieces of this talk are just to sort of walk through some concepts that, uh, that if we were to apply um, some of these concepts here, or maybe future concepts, we might be able to get a little more information about these uh, individual joint contributions. So if you remember um, in the previous slide, uh, the ground reaction force, the difference between limbs and ground reaction force was not even our primary variable in, in understanding what was happening at the joint. Um, so what we needed to take into consideration was the location, again, of this center of pressure and or more importantly, sort of the location of this ground reaction force vector relative to each of these joint centers. Now, again, these are estimations of how that uh, total load is going to be uh, distributed throughout the joints. Um, but a couple things that we've been doing here uh, using the, our force plate technology along with the synchronization of a, a 2D video camera, we've been sort of using an overlay of this information to be able again to estimate how one joint may be acting or one limb may be acting versus another. Now this is sort of a crude overlay here. It requires that we take video and we synchronize it with um, the force plates. And these arrows, these artificial arrows coming up are literally the same arrows that we're seeing in our 3D um, assessments. And here we can do what I just did earlier when we were tra drawing these lines um, and getting an idea of what um, the moment arms for the external force are. So I'm going to give you a second to take a look at these. And if we were to say the green versus um, the yellow here, um, think about this. Uh, think about the distance from this force to the joint centers, which um, are crudely measured with dots that we placed on them, but probably good enough for understanding this concept. So think about these moment arms and think about which one of these colors um, is reflecting a lower demand on the knee and a higher demand at the hip. So the green is closer to the knee joint center. So this force has a small moment arm and it is not requiring a large demand from the knee extensors. Um, so this here has a lower demand on the knee versus the larger moment arm compared to the yellow here. It's further from the hip joint center. The same trajectory here is likely reflecting a larger demand at the hip. So we've been using this type of information to give us an idea of perhaps how the, the demand is distributed across the joints. Now, being the moving from my clinician to my science scientist side, we have not completed our study yet in actually being able to calculate these um, relationships and seeing how well they do in estimating this. But it really follows along the same line of this idea of this shift in center of pressure. A couple of things I want to bring up with respect to this is we look at these two grand reaction forces here and they may have different centers of pressure and this is sort of a crude overlay, but you can also notice that they are angled slightly differently. Now, one of the uh, limitations with some of the force plate um, assessments that you can do now is that they are done on force plates that are uh, manufactured to be a little bit uh, cost effective, and they only give you the vertical force. Even if um, they the person is shifting the force in the anterior posterior direction, it's only going to measure the vertical force. And you can see here in this really slight description here is that if this green force is shifted uh, or rotated or directed a little more anteriorly, it's sneaking it closer to that knee joint angle. And this definitely is a strategy that individuals use to shift that demand. They'll shift the center of pressure, but they may also be shifting sort of the anterior posterior components of that. It's not clear to me how important those are and how important they are across different tasks, 
they certainly would be important if you were looking at a deceleration task because a lot of that force is directed in an anterior posterior direction. So a couple things to think of um, with uh, with respect to the this technology. We have a couple pictures here, uh, sort of showing. I think this was a single limb, maybe a single limb drop jump, but again, just showing the differences in the the um, force trajectories, where one of them appears, and this is just a single frame, but one of them appears to be going through the knee, where the other one is posterior to the knee. So we might estimate that this one has a higher demand on the knee um, versus uh, places a higher demand on the knee versus this. So a couple uh, a couple features here with respect to force plate technology that I hope you sort of pulled away from this. Um, first of all, in our ACL group, uh, loading the loading deficits in this population, and I can't imagine um, across populations are are usually a lot more profound um, than we can see. If we can see them, then we know that they're bad. If we can't see them, we can't assume that they're not there. Force data, at least in these lower extremity tasks, may give us a little bit of a hint as to uh, how they're progressing, where their deficits may lie. Um, the strength of these uh, commercially available uh, data now is in the comparison between limbs and their vertical force, or how much how much they're using each of those limbs in a vertical direction, and um, in the ability to take a couple very well patterned expected tasks, look at the data and say, is this is this right? Uh, is this acceptable or unacceptable with respect to the task? And is it acceptable versus unacceptable when we compare between limbs? I think this uh, the progress that needs to be made in looking at uh, using this ground reaction force information, the forces and the center of pressure. Um, to be able to break this down and estimate what's going on at each of the joints is sort of the next step in this uh, in this technology within the commercial space. Um, but again, I love the technology. Um, I think it's giving us a lot of information. Um, I thank you for your time in this, uh, and I, I look forward to having questions later um, in, in the live session. But I also want to make sure that everybody knows that if I ever said I, um, and when I did say we, that uh, all of this work that um, has been done here is a, a collaboration across all the individuals who've worked in my lab, in particular these, these four individuals uh, with the data that was presented here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sigward, for that wonderfully prepared and presented presentation. Um, so I'm gonna just, we're gonna do about five or six minutes of live Q&A, and I, I thank you everyone for um, submitting your questions in the chat. That was very helpful and took advantage of our time. So I'll pass it over to you, Dr. Santos, to lead the Q&A, and there you go. Hello, uh, first of all, thank you so much, Susan, uh, for being here and to uh, have your presentation every day. Uh, we already talked about that before. We liked, uh, really liked the work that you do there. And for everyone, I also like to thank you all for the questions uh, on our Q and A on our chat. Uh, I really like when we have a lot of questions there, so uh, it opens uh, a little bit of a space for discussion at the end. Um, and Alyssa will talk about that later, but I will. I don't want to steal your thunder here, Alyssa, but I already put in our chat, uh, our YouTube channel and our Twitter there. So if you guys want to uh, know about new uh, webinars and events we're putting there. So I'll go over a couple of questions that I have here. And then Susan, I'll, I'll let you um, go forward. And if you want to extend on any of the questions that we had in the chat, you feel free to for that okay. but uh, I just want to start with a question that so you talk about uh, a squat and counter movement jump uh, as task assessments are there any other types of tasks uh, that you can test in the, test in the force plate uh, that you have done or that you know about you know, I can imagine if I were to put my clinical hat on and I was to say, you know, I want to try to put force plates in the clinic, I could imagine that there are any tasks that 
that you want to know how much weight they're bearing in each of the limbs. You could do a sit to stand off of a, you know, a chair or something. I mean, you can think across populations. I know we're talking about ACL reconstruction, but, you know, uh, total joint replacements, any of those types of things, those are, those are sort of fair game. But if you were to go up that criterion based um, sort of progression, the best tasks to use for the force plates are um, vertically directed tasks, ones that we use as exercises and or assessments. So uh, landing and jumping are great. Um, single limb landing and jumping as well are good. Um, you certainly, I think it just came up in the, in the chat here, um, certainly, uh, if you were to do a single limb vertical jump versus a bilateral vertical jump, you're probably going to see some some uh, probably see some more profound differences in that force time profile, or at least in pieces of it. Um, people with a single limb uh, vertical jump can um, can cheat and get up pretty high um, by using their other leg too. That helps them propel themselves up. Um, but any of those tasks, I think, are are good for that. Um, for the assessments and the the importance with um, the bilateral tasks is that you have two force plates. Uh, you could do them and stagger. I'll do one with one leg, one with the other. But you're really now sort of putting in their head one of these feet is on a force plate and they're measuring it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do better on that side. Um, I really caution a lot of the clinicians when they're looking at any of this new technology out to think, oh well, I can already do that that task. Why would I want to buy technology for that? The technology that's coming out right now, I, don't, I, I personally don't think that it's ready for um, these sort of, I'm gonna go have my patient do some crazy sort of task and it's gonna tell me if they're doing it right or wrong. In fact, I'm not sure that's ever a goal we'll get to. Unfortunately, the, the technology is not magic. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be able to um, uh, determine, you know, uh, some change of direction task with some external cue and be able to compare this consistently. Um, the other thing that I think is probably really appropriate, and, and you guys probably know that from the bird tech side more than I do, is looking at balance. Um, now, this isn't a force, this is a center of pressure measurement, but um, again, you can use, you know, how far a center of pressure is moving under the foot or, out, or under the base of support and compare that to the other leg or compare that to a different task and say, I want this to either move, I want this to not move as far, I want it to move smaller. So again, you have a measure of center of pressure, like, oh, what does this number mean? But, but intuitively, we can understand that information in our clinical practice pretty well um, as well. Yeah, uh, talking about balance and force plates, uh, uh, we, we're being uh, looking around shear forces and all those other uh, variables lately, and then it's being really interesting. Uh, just to corroborate with what you said here, uh, with athletes, the way you used to use a way that I really like, if you have athletes that you uh, have a specific team and you have this control that you can actually have them throughout the whole season. We used to do a lot of this uh, before, during, postseason. And if you can have this data points of one specific athlete, it's way easier for you to start seeing, hey, there's one side here with something my goal or something is going on right now. So if you can do this assessment continuously in, a, in an athlete, I feel like this is can also work as injury prevention. I know there's a lot of research to be done. I know there's a lot of things to, for us to, to still work on that. I also agree that, uh, I don't know if we're looking forward to say, you're doing wrong, you're doing right, you know, you're doing right. But I think interpretation is important coming from the clinician. Yeah. And to have interpretation, it's uh, you have to build the equipment, you have to learn about the equipment, and you have to understand what data you're getting from there. Um, and I, that's, you know I wanted to throw one question out before um, too many people took off. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm wondering, and I think I had them do a, put a little poll together. I'm wondering of the people here um, in this talk, how many, what, what is your familiarity with force plates? Oh, there it is. And I hope <laughs> that was, uh, I hope that was, uh, the question was, answer was written well enough. Um, nice. Wow. Get out, nice. 
Oh, changing numbers. There we go. <laughs> now, I hope that I, I, I do see um, uh, some uh, research uh, related uh, people on this call here. So I hope that the the 16%, 17% um, isn't uh, skewed by those who have access to these because of research. Um, Sherry, who else is on here? <laughs> um, because, you know, I, I think this technology is becoming much more accessible uh, to the sort of consumer being the physical therapist and the athlete because of what the teams have been doing. And the teams have been using this and they've been translating. Um, oh, that's pretty good there. Um, they've been translating this information into that practical world. Um, certainly, this information would be good in a clinical sense to say, are they getting better at something? Obviously, we don't have the healthy person, um, the, the person when they're healthy, when you're in the clinic. Um, you haven't seen them before, so you don't have your baseline data. Um, and that makes it trickier for your um, for you to have information on you know what is where do I want to go with them and that's why the other leg is is pretty important and having a task that has expectations and that's where you you look to all the people using the force plates now and saying I know what this profile looks like for this task or this task and the profile that I showed with that uh, particular athlete actually the overall pro overall profile I didn't like um, because. The first sort of peak in that uh, in the uh, jump force, um, which is indicating where it was decelerating, was very low compared to the second peak. Um, so I, you could sort of say, oh, I, I understand what the shape looks like, and I don't think that looked good, and I don't think it looked good between the two limbs. So you can start, you know, making some a, a little more judgment on that when you have a task that's done fairly consistently. Yeah, uh, to me, uh, the poll is really interesting because I was not expecting 53% of people and that's, uh, that's really good. That uh, to me means that uh, there is a there is a big interest there and people are actually want to. I think it might be a sample to... bias for sure. Yeah, <laughs> it could be a sample bias. <laughs> I always like to, to think positive about that. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been wanting, uh, I've been always talking, it's been... I, most definitely with you too, but right, it's been more than 10 years, uh, 10, 11, 12 years that I'm working with this. And I always tell people we should have force plates in the clinics. Uh, and well, they can and, you help know, us. and honestly, uh, that's the challenge back to Birdtech is, you know, having uh, <laughs> products, <laughs> having products that are very easy to do and have options that make the cost, uh, the juice worth the squeeze there. Mm -hmm. when it comes to the clinic um and uh i'm, I'm really enthusiastic about the, pro the progress and the direction of a lot of the force plate companies so mm -hmm. um this is my little this is my little jab to get people to you know get <laughs> no, <everything>. it, <laughs> <laughs> what i can say again none of the webinars are uh we're not here to talk about our products right but okay. what i can say is like we we hear you and we hear everyone we are working on it. You guys can uh, thank me later. <laughs> <laughs> we're working on it. Uh, uh, we have the accuracy as uh, our always like is our main focus for everything. So, but, but the other thing too, I think, um, when you're talking from a clinical perspective, the cost is huge. How easy yeah. it is to do the test. How much yeah. the test makes sense. But I'm hoping that even though I spent a lot of the first part of the talk talking about the research, not necessarily how you use the force plates, but uh, I, I hope that the point I made with this research is, is that mm -hmm. uh, these are really profound deficits. And these are deficits that persist for a really long time in a lot of the studies, across studies, honestly. And, and I know when, when I first started seeing these studies coming from the clinical side, I said, oh, well, these guys must not be getting very good physical therapy. But honestly, that's just not the answer. That's not the answer at all. I think that there are things that, that, uh, that we don't see, and then we don't see them, so we can't address them. And then our patients, they adopt these 
underloading strategies and, they, and then they get comfortable and they perform just fine otherwise. So, um, so they, they continue on. So I'm hoping as the world turns towards uh, more um, technology and that technology, uh, you know, uh, the clinicians can find meaning in it and application uh, with that technology uh, and help improve outcomes. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. Uh, we do have uh, a, a road a friend, uh, ahead of us, I would say it's not that long anymore. Uh, it was way longer before, right? Yeah. Uh, sure. if, if we talk about amputees or, or other more like vertical forces on, on people, I always, I remember, I, I, I told you and I, and I joke about that, right? I have patients and I say, okay, 20% uh, on that leg, how you do that, right? And sometimes uh, technologies are there for help us, but we also have to understand what is the data yep. that is giving us. And unfortunately, we still don't have something that would just give you all the results. And I don't believe we'll, we'll have that because the results has to come from the clinician, yep. right? So That is probably a good place to wrap up. I'm the timekeeper. Struggling with figuring out how long to let you go over because it's such good stuff, and I don't, I don't want people to feel like they're missing out if they drop off. Um, well, you know, I could talk forever, but I'm on vacation right now. Oh, I, just... <laughs> I didn't even realize what a gift to present on your vacation. Oh, amazing! Thank you. Um, so <laughs> let's yeah. even more valuable now. Um, well, we'll let you get back to the boat, but. I'll just plug the future webinars really quickly for those of you that can join us next time. And of course, you can catch this video uh, by early next week when we have it all edited and all that good stuff um, on YouTube at Vertech HQ. And Fernando put that in the chat. But the next webinar isn't until August 11th, and that'll be with our favorite neurooptometrist, Dr. Charlie Shearer. And that'll be on visual processing speed and reaction time, its relevance in sports and rehabilitation. And then following that, on Wednesday, August 25th, we'll have Dr. Rebecca Bliss presenting on vestibular ocular dysfunction post-concussion. So just a quick, um, quick background on her. Dr. Bliss is a clinical assistant teaching professor in the Doctor of Physical Therapy program at the University of Missouri. She specializes in concussion management and is board certified in neurological physical therapy. So we we'll look forward to both of those coming up. And thank you so much, Dr. Sigward, uh, for that great presentation. And we really could talk to you for hours. So please come back <laughs> and talk more on anything you'd like to present. <laughs> you have an ongoing invitation. Thank you, Dr. Santos. And um, go enjoy your vacation. And well, we'll talk to you later. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Okay. Bye.